to someone and say, hey, hey can I have something taken notes on those online? Make sure you're taking notes. Um, but on the back of your worship folder, there's a place as well for you to doodle and take notes. Well, we are going to be continuing on looking through this um, sermon of Jesus that we've been looking at, Sermon on the Mount, and we're in Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 27 and 28. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28, is where we're going to plant ourselves. And uh, uh, it's interesting, we see how Jesus, through this message, it just seems like he gets more and more urgent. Um, it seems like he gets more and more, um, uh, I just, more intentional, if you will, specifically relationally. And uh, I want to, as we look at these words, it says, reading in verse, uh, and again, if you don't have your Bibles with you, um, it'll be on our screens behind me, as well as where you're sitting somewhere, um, you just pull out a, a Bible, and uh, if you don't own a Bible, then take that one, and we want to make sure we, you have a Bible in your hands. But I want to read from Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. It says these words, you have heard that it was said to those of old. Now, I want to stop right there for a minute. You've heard it said, uh, uh, you've heard that it was said to those of old. And so what's Jesus saying? And he goes on and goes, says, you shall not commit adultery. We talked about this a few weeks back, if I'm not mistaken, about this idea that Jesus says, you've heard it said that, that it was said to those of old, that Jesus, what he's about to make a statement is, in other words, this realigning or aligning himself with God. And if you weren't able to be with us back a few weeks ago, then again, let me encourage you to go and watch online our teaching time to catch up. Where we talked about how this is a huge statement that Jesus, and they would have, uh, eventually, it would have, a light bulb would have went off, and they would have been thinking, oh, wait a minute. Is Jesus, he's saying that he's God. He is putting himself in this place because he goes on to say, in other words, he's adding to it. He says in verse 28, he says, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And now you can hear a pin drop. Complete silence now. It's quiet. Suddenly all is quiet in the room. And online. And some of us are thinking, well, I'm not going to say anything about this one today. I'm just going to sit there and uh, I'm just going to keep my eyes straight ahead. I'm not going to turn to my right, turn to my left. I'm not going to look at anybody or anything like that. <clears throat> See, it's interesting how Jesus, and like I just shared, he's, he's, he's more intentional. It's like he's elevating um, this sin, if you will. He's elevated to the point that this, his realization is this is a hard issue. You know, you may not have done the act of adultery, Jesus is saying, the adulterous act or whatever, but if you've even thought about it in your heart with lust, he's taking it a step further. He's making it a hard issue, which we're going to address in just a second. Like it, when we can talk about this idea specific of the heart. We'll get to that in a minute. You know, he says you're guilty of that. And again, suddenly, it gets completely quiet. And then we start to look at our society, our culture, our world today specifically, and we see how perverse, in so many ways, our culture has become and is becoming. And see, I would go even a step further, and we've already talked about this over the past several weeks. I'd go a step further and say that, uh, that it, it, it's demonic. We have to start realizing, and, and we're going to say that you're going to hear this over and over and over again. We have to start realizing that people and individuals are not the enemy. They're not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. The evil one is the enemy. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he will do whatever he can to succeed at that. See, ultimately, again, Satan's job or his desire is not for us to worship him, but his desire is just from, from, uh, for us 
to keep us from actually worshiping God, to serving God, and being in this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We have to start to call it what it is. We have to start to call it that we are at war, and this is a spiritual battle, and preparing ourselves and continue to prepare ourselves for this war. And this is a huge thing that we are talking about this weekend. Not to, to undermine anything else, but this is something that is, in a lot of ways, at the forefront. What's going on in, in your heart is Jesus is addressing here. And I, I love the way Jeremiah, and I think it's very clear the way Jeremiah says it in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Circle that word heart if you're there, or write that word actually a heart in your, in your notes. The heart is deceitful above all things, and is desperately wicked. Well, that paints a vivid picture, does it not? And he goes on to say, Jeremiah goes on to say, and who can know it? See, our hearts are where the sin is. Is what Jesus is addressing. And some of us, when we think of the word heart, we think about what we've learned down to the years and what we each one of us have that is actually, um, how many of you are alive this morning? This weekend? Okay. And, and, and part of that is due to what? It is the heart. The flow, the blood flow through the heart. And some of you at times have had to go and have different procedures done on your heart. Have you not? You've had to have different, maybe a, a vowel worked on or something done to help, maybe a blockage or something like that with the heart. So a lot of times when we see in Scripture this idea of the heart, that's immediately what we go to. But so often in Scripture, that is not the case. When we talk about the heart, it usually referring to not necessarily the blood pumping, not necessarily what we have, what we're used to uh, identifying with, but it means something, and you can write this in your notes, please. It's something that we see that's so much deeper than that. It's a deeper thing that Jesus is addressing here. It's a deeper thing that we see throughout Scripture that Jeremiah is addressing. He's not talking about the heart pumping. He's talking about something deeper. He's talking about the soul. He's talking about our very being. That's what he's talking about. So it isn't saying the heart that pumps is wicked. It's not saying the heart that pumps is, 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 is deceitful. It's saying that there's something that goes deeper, talking about the soul, our very being. That's why so often we see all throughout Scripture this idea, this imagery, imagery if you will, this picture. There I can say that word. Picture. Of a heart transplant. Of a need of a heart change. And we see this specific warning all throughout the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. It says these words. Flee what? Fortification. Flee fortification. I'm going to stop right there for just a minute. We'll get back to this. You know, just leave this up there. We'll get back to this in just a minute. Flee fortification. I want to read off just some things for you. You can try to jot these down in your notes. They're not going to be on the screen, so try to jot these down in your notes if you want to. You can catch me afterwards, but more than anything, I want you just to hear these numbers. A recent study found that 91.5% might as well say 92%. Can we say 92%? Are you allowed to say that? 92%, if you will, 91.5, 92% of men and 60.2, so 60% of women in a recent statistic reported using porn in the past month. 92% of men. 60% of women reported using porn in the past month. It's estimated that 40 million, say 40 million for me. 40 million American, Americans regularly visit porn sites. 
40 a million Americans. 70% of men age 18 to 24. 70% of men age 18 to 24 visit pornographic websites at least once per month. There are over 4.2 million adult websites, making up about 12% of all websites right now. 52% of online pornography consumers in the United States are aged 35 to 49. Let me give you one more number. 53% of ministers, pastors, are involved in some form of pornography. Let me say that again. 53% of ministers, pastors, are involved in some form, form of pornography over the past month. And I would, in my personal, in my, I, per, I believe that that number is actually higher. I just don't believe that some are being completely honest. Through statistics and through polls. A few years back, I was late one evening sitting around watching TV with the family and had a phone call. And I, I saw that it was a, a minister friend that had called and said, Hey, Jonathan, um, I'm sorry to call and bother you this late, but would you be able to come over to the house and, and talk with um, myself and uh, his wife? Can you come over to the house? And I could tell that there was some stress in his voice. And uh, I said, sure. So I said, give me just a few minutes. I'll be right over there. And I went over to the minister's house, and he met me at the door, and he just eyes just rolled up, and tears started to roll down his face. His wife was already sitting in their living room, and you could tell that she was uncomfortable. You could tell that she'd been crying. As soon as I walked through, she just started crying again, and both of them, the tears are just welling up, just bawling. After... Then finally gaining their composure a little bit, I started asking, so, so what's going on? And I can see that this is, you just didn't call me over here. You just, you, she usually would make a dessert or something. I said, you just didn't call me over here for a dessert or something. Well, what's going on? And they started to share with me that my friend, for many years, had been struggling with pornography. And it had just reached a point in, uh, where from a husband and wife, and at this point, and we, I started to walk through with them and accountability and different things like that. To start to walk through the process of healing. But before the process of healing could take place, there had to be a realization, okay, where are we at right now? So we had to talk and deal with that. I wish I could say that that was the only time I've ever done that with a minister. But it's not. That's why I think that number is actually not accurate. I think it's higher. I went off to Bible college in 1988. In 1988, this was... One of the, this was the number one issue on Bible College campus. Pornography. I say this on multiple accounts. First of all, I want us to realize that we're not, none of us are exempt from this. Second of all, I want us to realize, like I just said a little while ago, this is demonic. This is demonic. I'm not saying that the individuals that are participating in are demonic. That, and so don't please realize, I, I, and I've said it over again, over again, I'm going to continue to say it, but you need to, got to realize that people are not the enemy. And people are not the problem. We've all sinned, and we've got to realize we've all sinned and we've all fallen short. If I was preaching on gossip this weekend... It would not be as quiet, I bet, now as it is now. We 
We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. But through our society, through our culture, and just it, it is making its way, Satan, if he can separate, if he can divide, if he can destroy the family in any way, if he can stop and prevent individuals from, from and just keep them beaten down with, just, with uh, uh, shame and sin, instead of experiencing the grace and healing of God. Now the Greek word, what, let me say this, the Greek word here, pornea, say pornea for me. That's an A. That doesn't look like an A. That's just an A. Still doesn't look like an A, does it? Oh, yeah. The word pornea, or por pornea, is the word for fornication, it's the Greek word. <clears throat> where we actually get the word, I bet a lot of you can see this and know, we get, it's where we get the word pornography. Sexual immorality. Anything that's sexual outside of marriage is fornica fornication. Now back to the slide, it says flee fornication. What are we to do? See this word right here? What do we do? Flee. Flee. Circle that. Underline that. Put it in your notes. What does flee mean? Move away. Run. Skedaddle. Leave. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And that's what Jesus is talking about. The sin in our heart, in other words, heart in our very being, in other words, what's going on in our very being, what's going on in our soul. So fornication, sexual immorality, is something that needs to be dealt with. And dealt with, and write this in your notes, please, dealt with drastically. Can you say drastically for me? Drastically. Needs to be dealt with drastically. But before we get there, I want us to look at a time over in the Old Testament. A very familiar passage to a lot of people. But I want us to look over at 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. There's a time in the life of King David. Again, a very familiar story. A lot of you know we're all actually just by past the scripture I just said out there that you are, are uh, you know immediately where we're going and what we're going to talk about. David, King David, a man that was considered to be after God's own heart. But again, David's not perfect. There, there is sin in David's life. And we're going to see and we're going to walk through this, uh, specifically this first part of this time in the life of David, uh, at this time with David and Bathsheba. And it says in verse 1, in the spring of the year. So what time of year? Spring. In the spring. we got to get through fall and winter and then uh, and just... Uh, after we do that, after we get through all that, then they'll be what? We'll be anxious for what? Spring. Things start to come back to life. Things start to grow. Things start to green out. And it says there in the spring of the year when, when kings normally go out to war. So when do kings normally go out to war to battle? They go out to war when? In, uh, in the spring of the year. Write that in your notes, please. Very important. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Ribah. However, David did something. What did David do? David stayed behind. He stayed behind in Jerusalem. Underline that in your Bible or highlight that. He stayed behind in Jerusalem. Notice this is a time when kings uh, would go to war. They would go out and they would go with their army out to fight, out to battle. And David this time, for whatever reason, has decided that, no, I'm not going to go with my army. I'm going to stay. 
stay behind. And put out your notes here, whether it be out beside this passage. David is in a dangerous state. David has taken a time or come to a point in his life where he has decided, okay, I'm going to send my army out. But he's, in other words, he's grown complacent, a time of rest. It's, uh, it's, it's, let me share it with you this way. I've shared with you before that there was a season in our life as a family. Um, I, I, I've always, I, I, I am a huge believer in prayer. I'm a huge believer in praying very intentionally. I, I've talked about you guys multiple times about that. The need to, to uh, and you, you, if you go on my phone, in fact, I went back and looked the other day. I, um, just on my, this phone alone, on the journal, prayer journal, I look back now, I can go all the way back to, 2000, I think, 2020, or maybe 2019, I can't remember, that I have prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer on my phone that I can punch up with the date of different prayers that I have prayed. I have journal, prayer journal after prayer journal after prayer journal uh, of, of just down to the years of journaling. The times that I've, and I've shared with you through prayer, of walking through, where, whether it's if you're visiting uh, family, your grandparents, whatever it is. If you're even just invited over to someone's house and you're walking through and you ask if you use the restroom, I would encourage you to do this. You think, well, you're crazy. No, uh, yes, I am crazy, but I still would encourage you to do this. But I used to walk through our house to do what our house now. But I walked through, and specifically when my children would go off to school, I'd walk through the house, and I would just go, and I'd pray real quickly in the room. And when I was in the living room, I'd pray in the living room over the things that would go on. Praying very specifically. But there was a season in the life of our family where I was physically, emotionally, and mentally exhausted and tired. And I can go back in my family and I can actually pinpoint this time in the life and the seasonal life of our household where my prayers changed. I started being more relaxed. It wasn't that I wasn't praying, just the very things I was praying for changed. I was more relaxed. I, 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 my prayer said, I was like, God, we were so tired. We were so tired as a family. We were so, God, just give us rest. Can we just have rest? Give us rest. And, and, and not that rest is wrong. Don't get me wrong on that. But what I'm getting to is the fact that I, I, I wasn't. My very being wasn't in a place. It wasn't that my life with God and I was still worshiping. Still preaching, all that. I just wasn't as urgent and intentional about it. And things started to rise up. Specific, specifically in this season of life as a family, we can pinpoint it back now. I can pinpoint and tell you exactly what was going on. When we started to see more and more attacks on our family. In other words, we let, let me say it this way. We let our guard down. I let my guard down. I was leading my family. I let my guard down. David, here, he's letting down his guard. He's letting down his guard. He's becoming complacent, if you will. David probably has reached a point that he's, he's rested. Maybe it's a point that he, he's grown comfortable. He'd gone through this time. Maybe he was, uh, you know, maybe he was, uh, he'd been sitting around all winter eating and being waited on and taken care of and really had to make some, maybe during the season, had to make, had, had to make some tough decisions, more relaxed and all. And said, you know what? You know, you all go out and fight. I'm just going to stay here. It's beautiful around here this time of year. I haven't ever really got to see this. I want to see what it looks like. <coughs> David stayed behind in Jerusalem. It was a huge part of this time in David's life. And I want us to emphasize that I don't want you to miss. 
Verse 2 goes on to say this. Late one afternoon after his midday rest. You notice how often even we see here in the writing in 2 Samuel. It, it, it already. We're, not, we're, only in the second, we're only in the very first part of, of verse 2. In, in referring to laying behind. Resting. It says late in the, on one afternoon after his day of rest. What in the world would he need to rest from? David got out of bed. You know something? When did he get out of bed? Some of you are going, oh no. That's me getting out of bed. We go around and say, when did you get up? Well, I, well actually. David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Now, do you, let me just stop right there. Do you think this is the only time that David ever walked out on the top of his roof? Do you think that it's the only time that this woman ever took a bath? Just saying. Verse 3 says, he sent someone to find out who she was. Duh! Like he didn't know who she was. I mean, already, do you, do you, I want you to see the deceitfulness that's going on here. Already see how, the, the, what is making its way, the evil, that's, the sin that's already making its way in. Don't miss this. We can misconstrue what's going on. He sent someone to find out who uh, who she was. Do you not think that he'd ever met her before? We'll get reason why he probably hadn't met her before. Amen. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elim, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, just circle or highlight this. I just, this, see this. She just, sent, she just sent, sent a message saying, I'm pregnant. What are we going to do? I'm happy to love you now. Say, I'm pregnant. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. I wish that was the end of the story. But I want you to see, I, we gotta, we got to see how just the layers of it. How one thing just adds on to another. Just like, if David had gone out with his army like he was supposed to do, if we would just do what we're supposed to do, if we just would hold to our commitment, if we would just do what we're and be where we're supposed to be, notice if David had been with his army, this never would have happened. And it just lays upon layer upon layer upon layer. And, and the layers don't stop. If you go on, it's not going to be our screens right now. But, but I want you just, if you look on and, and what happens next, I just want to share with you what goes on. David is heard, or David finds out, but she was sent word, like we read, that she's pregnant. And then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And if you read on there, and later on today or throughout the week, maybe you can go back and you can read through and you can study and see some more what happens. But David has Uriah who's out. He's left his wife and is actually out with the army. And he's there and he sends word for him to be brought back. 
for him to come back, and he comes back, and if you read on there, you'll see that there's discussion, and he says, well, you know, well, just go home, spend some time with your wife. In other words, he wants him to sleep with his wife. He wants him to be with his wife, trying to cover up this idea of her already being pregnant. And we see there, if you look on, that David finds out the next morning that he didn't go, that he actually refused to go because, and we see that, don't miss this, that Uriah is such a man of integrity, such a man of character, that because of the ark of the Lord, and because the army is out fighting, he says, I can't go be with my wife, I can't go home and eat from my, my tables and all this, because not while my army's out, not while the ark of the Lord's out fighting, not out while things are going, I cannot do that. You don't miss this idea. In fact, you can write in your notes, please. See the character and the integrity here? Of your right? So David continues on, level upon level on level. He's scheming even more. He, he comes up and he says, Yes, Uriah, come over to his house. And, and he gets Uriah drunk. Plans are that he would go this time and spend time with his wife. And again, we see that he doesn't go. So if you move on into the story, and if you move on down into verse 14, you see that actually he sends Uriah back. He sees that Uriah is not going to actually go be with his wife, not going to go be with Bathsheba. So he sends him back to fight, and he sends a letter with him to Joab. And basically the letter says to put Uriah at the very front of the lines. Why? So that he will be healed. Do you see where this has gotten David to? Do you see how this is just boiling up in David's life? One deceit after another deceit after another deceit after another sin. One sin after another sin after another sin after another sin. After another sin. <coughs> Until finally, Word is actually sent back to David that Uriah has been killed. That Uriah is dead. It's not on your screen, but I, hope you, I want you to listen, at least listen to these words. If you're not able to see them, if you don't have your Bibles turned up. But in verse 25, I want you to listen to David's words. I want you to listen. At this time, it's like, here's a man that God said, this is a man after my own heart. But I want you to see right now in David's life where his heart is at. How complacent he is. You're right, a man of integrity and character. I'm not going to go be with my wife, not while my men are out there fighting. David, where's he been all so spring? Where's he been? He's been in the palace, sleeping till midday. Letting down his guard. Not guarding his integrity, not guarding his character. Uriah, now is dead. And listen to these words that, he, that David says, says, Well, tell John not to be discouraged. David said, the sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. You see how flippant David is about this? He says, don't be discouraged. You know, someone dies today, someone dies tomorrow. Then David goes on to say, he doesn't stop there. He says, find harder next time and conquer the city. Those are David's words about Uriah. Look at these last words, verse 26 and verse 27. Be on our screen as well. It says,
When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace. And she became one of his what? And she became one. Don't miss that. Now, I know this, the time culture, and we, that's a sermon for another time, uh, to explain what's going on, but, but don't miss this. And she became one of his wives. It says, then she gave birth to a son. And then underline this, highlight this, I already underlined it for you. It says, but the Lord was what? Displeased with what David had done. <laughs> what David had done. We have to see, I want us to see that we're from the heart. Not to, we're talking, talking about when we talk about the heart and dealing with the heart and the heart change, find a heart change. Is it something about the very being, about the soul? And David at this time and seen in sin. We, we're just talking about this specific and Jesus is addressing this sin and wants the people in the audience to see this and wants us as part of the audience to see this. What specifically here? But this is with sin in general. Sin is sin. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. But do we see what sin can do? Sin can, as Satan is, he wants to destroy. He wants to destroy the family. He wants to destroy the unity of the family. If I could do anything to, to mess up or destroy the family, if I was to destroy the, 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 the unity of the church, if I can do anything to mess it up or destroy the unity of the church, I can just weave my way in. Just do a little bit. And it just goes from one to the other. Do you see how it built? And it built and it built and it built. And sin just built. So finally, we are just making decisions and thinking and not what well, we're not thinking. So fornication, sexual immorality is something. And the last thing here, write this down if you haven't already, write this down in your notes. It's something that needs to be dealt with. And like we've already said, but write it in your notes if you haven't already. It's something that needs to be dealt with and needs to be dealt with drastically. Okay, now we've said multiple times drastically. What exactly does drastically mean? And, and then the question is, how drastic should we be? You say drastic, how drastically should we be? Well, let me just say, that is a great question. And next weekend, we're going to see, and we're going to walk through, how Jesus actually answers that question. How do we deal with it? How do we walk with someone through this? How do we walk through with someone that it's dealing with? How in today's society and culture? You know, like I said, back, back to this, back to this. 90, 92%, 91.5 of all men and 60.2 of all women are reported using porn in the past month. Just the specific. How do we deal with this? Well, we certainly don't <coughs> walk away from people. We certainly don't throw our hands up in the air. Next weekend, we'll see how Jesus deals or shares with us how it should be dealt with and how healing can take place.
Because here's the thing. Jesus is the answer. See, over the past several weeks, we've been talking about this, and we've been closing out with this idea, and I say it again. This is what Jesus, all through us, we don't miss what Jesus is trying to get the audience here and trying to get us as being part of the audience, trying to get us to see that Jesus is the answer. To be a demonstration to share Jesus. Jesus is the answer. And here's the thing. And let me just say this again. We'll go. But so often in whatever sin. Whether it be the sin of pornography. Or be the sin of, of, of another form of addiction. Or be the sin of gossip. Or be the sin of lying. Jesus died on the cross to cover all sin. It is the blood of Jesus. That bridges the gap between us and God. I saw this this past week um, by a minister acquaintance, and I try to catch his message every weekend. He, he shared one of the best illustrations. I want to close with this. He shared one of the best illustrations I've ever seen. Specifically dealing with men and with husbands in the family. Because, and, and he was referring to, and I like to get into it, but referring so often, specifically, and I'm talking to men now. So often, we get like David, we actually check out. We go into a day of rest. And not just a day, not just a day of Sabbath, day of rest. No, we're in day of rest. How long have you been day of rest? I've been day of rest now, not just spring, but spring, summer, fall, winter. And, 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 and my uh, the minister has this too. He, he, he said, he said, you know, we see this all the way back in, in Genesis. In the first three chapters of Genesis, if you look back, you see Adam and Eve. And with Adam and Eve, and you see that Eve is there, and and, and Adam, and, and they take of this fruit that they were instructed not to, and the deception that happens with Satan. And here's the thing he was saying. When, when once they had sinned, and, and, and when, when they sinned, and and they are, um, God appears and God's talking to them. And who, who does he holler out for? When he can't find Adam and Eve, who does he holler out for? Anybody remember? Adam, not Eve. Adam, Adam, where are you? Interesting. Adam, where are you? He goes on to say he, that, that Adam says, shares with him what happened, and he blames whom? He doesn't say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, you told us not to. No, it wasn't. Who immediately, who does he blame? Eve. Eve. And Eve blames whom? In fact, if you go back, Adam actually says, well, you're... Adam says to God, well, you're the one. Well, actually, God, you gave that woman you gave me. Don't miss that part. So actually, who else is he blaming? God. God. Well, I'd be fine if you wouldn't have gave me that woman. <laughs> Eve does the same thing. Kind of goes back to what we talked about last week. Accepting consequences for our actions. See how Jesus is built upon one another? But here's the thing I want you to miss, and this one will close it. <laughs> we know what happened. But what if Adam, in that moment where he was complacent and he stepped away and he's there and he doesn't, what if Adam would have actually, when Satan is talking to Eve, would have stepped in and said, Leave her alone? You don't talk to her, you talk to me. What if Adam would have done what he was actually supposed to do? 
Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead and is at the right hand of God. Because Jesus looked at our sin and Jesus said, step back, I got this. It's on me. I'll bear your sin. And I'll bear your sin. And I'll bear your sin. I'll take your sin upon my shoulders. My shoulders, you say, my shoulders are big enough. I do what I've been called to do. And Jesus rose from the dead. And he's at the right hand of God as our defense attorney, as our mediator, as the great high priest on our behalf, doing exactly what he said he would do. Don't let the sin, don't let sin beat you up. As a follower of Christ, let Jesus do, let the blood of Jesus do what it was intended to do, to wash away your sin, to set you free. Not to be in the bondage of whatever that you feel bound by, but to be free, to thrive, to live as God intended us to live. Will you stand with me? Our Heavenly Father, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity.